Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, host of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So when it comes to using social media, specifically kids using social media, parenting style is an important question. Is making sure kids are kept safe from some of the harmful effects of social media simply a matter of parent involvement and parent established limits? What responsibilities do tech companies have to children? These companies certainly pretend that they care. They say they put in measures to curtail bullying and other problems. And yet there's a growing body of evidence, a really concerning body of evidence, that shows that these platforms are really quite harmful to young people. So what role does the government have, or should the government have any role in protecting kids against the what some people call predatory behaviors of some of these companies and the addictiveness of some of these platforms, particularly on young minds? Here to talk to me today about all of this and a few other topics is Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Rogers represents the 5th District of Washington State. She is the top Republican on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and she is the 200th woman to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I love this. She is the first woman to have given birth three times while serving in Congress. Kathy is an ability advocate for her son, Cole, who has Down syndrome, and she also has two daughters, Grace and Bryn, such pretty names. Earlier this year, the Congresswoman launched the Big Tech Accountability Platform to explore and expose how she says social media and tech companies are hurting children, how these platforms contribute to suicides and anxiety, how tech companies use algorithms to drive addiction, and she wants to explore the role tech companies play in child grooming and trafficking. In a recent hearing with big tech CEOs, the congresswoman said big tech was her biggest fear as a parent, adding, I have two daughters and a son with a disability. Let me be clear. I do not want you defining what is true for them. I do not want their future manipulated by your algorithms. I do not want their self-worth defined by the engagement tools you've built to own their attention. I do not want them to be in danger from what you've created. So that is pretty powerful stuff. And I guess that's a pretty good setup for my first question, Congresswoman. But first, thanks so much for coming on. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to join you today. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think the, the first thing, I mean, I, you know, you really spoke your mind at that hearing. You were talking, I think, voicing the concerns of so many parents out there, so many moms um, out there who are worried about big tech's effect on children. And what we're seeing out there, um, the, the studies are showing that kids are dealing with higher rates of, of depression and anxiety. There are higher rates of suicide. Um, why should parents, why do they need to be concerned about t- big tech and and big tech's effect on children? It's a great question. I, I can tell you that in my household, I have two daughters and a son with a disability, that my husband and I, we are fighting the big tech battles every day. And it has it has become my biggest fear as a parent. Because what I see is that it is a battle for their development. It's a battle for their mental health. It's ultimately a battle for their safety. And I know that I'm not alone. I, I know that I speak for millions of moms and parents across this country. We in, in Spokane, we we recently we we we've, we've been seeing an increase in, in teenage suicide in right. our in our high school. And as I've reached out to the schools and and started asking some questions, you know, what's going on with our kids? What's making them feel so alone and depressed and anxious? What I hear over and over, whether it's it's the administrators, the principals, the students themselves, teachers, is that they're raising the alarm bell on social media. And, and we know there are a, a number of studies that are, are highlighting the fact that if, if, if our children are, are more likely to spend time on social media, if they spend you know, four to six hours a day, that they're more likely to have suicidal tendencies. That we, there's, there's several studies that have been released in, in recent years that are highlighting these, these facts about the, the studies. And so the big tech needs to be held accountable. 
I, I, I totally agree with you. And I do feel like people are really starting to get worried about this much more. I feel like it's, it's cer- certainly since the COVID shutdown, since kids are at home so much more, um, probably have access to these these computers and these platforms. But, you know, you hear people say that parents need to have a greater role, right? And and I, I, I am sympathetic to that argument. Parents should be more present is what I hear a lot. Um, but I do think that some parents don't really know what's going on and how these companies are attracting kids and essentially addicting them to their platforms. You talk about the, in that incredible quote that I wrote, that I read right before you came on, you know, you're talking about manipulating them, algorithms, you know, defining mm-hmm. their self-worth. I mean, talk to me a little bit. How are these big tech companies working? Well, uh, yes. And as a parent, I would just say right now, it's not a fair fight. So right. Even, even the is come they could change the settings even at the beginning um but yet big tech is is choosing through their algorithms through their business models you know their goal is to keep our children on their devices as much as long uh, as long as they can they do they design their products to make sure that the user is is hooked and and is increasing their screen time and and so what we need is for big tech to be transparent and right now they are not being transparent they they know they know people like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, they limit their own children's use on technology uh, with technology. They have admitted that. And yet right now they they want to dismiss the concerns and the impact of their products on children and on our children's well-being. So, you know, we need parents to be able to make informed decisions. And and that's why I, I feel like right now it's not a fair fight for our parents. So that's why we are working, demanding more transparency. And, and as I mentioned, there's, there's a number of studies that have shown that if, if teens, if young adults spend more time on these social media platforms, that it absolutely impacts their well-being. Uh, they're, they're less happy. They have more feelings of loneliness and isolation, more depression. And that's what we need to make sure that we're addressing right now. And it I- has been heightened with COVID. Well, I will tell you, and I want to I want to pivot over to COVID in, COVID in a little bit, but I it's interesting. One thing that I I have to say kind of scared me is, you know, in that hearing, you asked them for more information, and I believe you followed up, and they still haven't given you some of the information that you asked for. Is that correct? It is correct. Uh, they they've given us you know the high level responses, but they have not answered these questions directly, and and we we are not going to stop pursuing this. I, I can assure you. I'm so, I, I, I'm so, I'm so grateful. Yes. Well, I'm, and, and you know, I, I, I just think we have to keep the pressure on. This is about our kids. This is a, this is about the safety and well-being of our children. And, and, and I'm also really concerned about the priorities of these companies, you know, because instead of working to really address these obvious harms, and there's the, there, there's the impact on their mental health, but also we are seeing child trafficking, child pornography, illegal drug sales on these platforms, and big tech seems to be focusing more on silencing conservatives and, and speech that doesn't fit their liberal orthodoxy, right? Yes. And so as a, as a Republican, as a conservative, I'm very concerned about their priorities. You know, I, 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 I said I'm, I'm so grateful, and part of the reason I am is it's, it, it is sort of terrifying when you think that if a powerful, the ranking, you know, Republican on, an, uh, on your powerful committee can't get answers out of big tech, you think of what, par- like the average parent, like me, who doesn't have, you know, really any power to, to, to get these people to pay attention to me. So pa- this is, I think, really, th- that little nugget of information is really impar- important for parents to understand that, you know, you, you have powerful people in Washington advocating for you and they can't even get full transparency on these questions and again it's okay and these these are questions you know not about proprietary information this is about how their how their product is is harming kids and again we have some some data on that that is pretty compelling so i i think that that to me is something that parents really need to take away from this is the fact that um, it is really hard to get information out of these companies and i am so grateful that there are people like you that are are and as you say you're not backing down so that is that is a relief for parents to know but i think you know one other thing one other thing to, to keep in mind oh i'm so sorry go ahead well, I was just going to say we're, we are not satisfied with what we've received, and we're going to we're going to stay on them. But I really appreciate the work that you're doing, Julie, to help to help inform parents, moms, 
uh, equip them. But part of our goal must be to raise up that army of moms and parents across this country that help demand that big tech be held accountable. Well, you know, it's an interesting too, and I think I've I've heard you talk about this as well. These companies are deploying more and more programs aimed at kids. Instagram has an app for under eight, you know, for children under thirteen. My children are constantly getting. It's funny, not my children. I'm getting invitations for a Facebook app for kids that I keep rejecting. Um, so it is interesting that they're is more and more of this. So at a younger age, sort of normalizing this idea of being on social media, um, where, I, you know, my personal parenting strategy is, <laughs> I, I, I shouldn't say this, because I, I hope they don't find out, but I've told them that it's like illegal to, <laughs> for them to be on <laughs> social media. Um, yeah, I've said that, oh, no, it's not me, it's the rules, right. And so and my kids don't have any desire, although I do have a 14 year old who, you know, I can see some of his friends, they all have phones, my child doesn't, you know, so I, I really work very, very hard to keep them away from these things. But again, these companies are deploying more and more of these programs. Well, and it's and it's and it's very common now. They say on average that eight to twelve year olds are spending between four and six hours a day on yeah. these devices, and and with teens, it's up to nine hours a day. So what what you find is that our own children are are with other kids that do have these devices and that are spending a right. lot of time on these sites and are and are being you know accorded all the time to spend more time, and unfortunately, it is having a negative impact. The studies yeah. are backing it up. You know, I wanted to pivot just a teeny bit, not quite to talking about school shutdowns and COVID, but I want to talk a little bit about schools. And I wrote about this a couple of months ago um, about uh, when my children's school went fully uh, virtual. Um, you know, it was a struggle for me to put limits on when <laughs> they're going to school and staring at a computer all day. Um, but I understood, you know, that was, you know, that was in the spring. That was when schools had just shut down. Um, but, but that's not just co a COVID reality. Schools are now super high tech. Most schools hand out Chromebooks. Kids are even seeing text or aren't even seeing textbooks anymore. Even in class work, which used to be done on a worksheet with a pencil is now computer based, at least in my children's school. And it's very frustrating. It's, uh, you know, my kid goes off to school and he's on a screen the whole day and, and it's normalizing it for him and then he comes home and all he hears me doing is screeching about getting off the computer and so I feel like I've I said once in my article I said I feel like I'm sharing custody with someone who doesn't share my parenting philosophy right because they go off for eight hours a day <laughs> and it's you know it's a screen time bonanza and then they come home and it's super limits why have mm -hmm. schools become so tech heavy is it investments by Google is it investments by these big tech companies that has caused schools to shift from classic education and from hard textbooks and workbooks entirely to sort of the Chromebook, you know, mm -hmm. high tech education. Why is that? Right. Well, that, I think that it is a great question. And I've had a similar experience. Uh, our son is in a public charter school here in Spokane. And it, it is it is true that during COVID, it's only increased uh, dramatically. It's increased dramatically the amount of time that he is in front of a screen. And even when he has been in school, when it was hybrid two days a week, and, and now just recently is now four days a week, I, I, I do hear that he's spending a lot of time on the yeah. screen. And, 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 and our son has a disability. And I, I, on one hand, I thought, well, okay, Part of this is more individualized learning, right? And I and I think that there there is an aspect of that that can be positive for the child. But what I'm seeing is that it just seems like across the board, it is just a shift yeah. to the, the the screen times, and and it's not always even educational, right? right. I, I I'm like he seems to be watching a lot of movies now at school, <laughs> right? right? So, right. Uh, I I I I really like the model where it's not. Hey, I want, I think every child learns differently sure. and we need to be aware of that. I think there can be a role for the, sure. the the computer in the school that is helping reinforce maybe material or take a test and, and see if the individual is actually learning the material. Sure. Um, I'd like, you know, but I, I too am concerned about how much of this is, is, is just putting a child in front of a screen rather than really focused on making sure that our kids 
are getting the best education possible, right? And that we are um, ensuring that they are reaching their full potential and that it is a partnership between the schools and the parents. Yeah, well, partnership between the schools and the parents, that's a whole nother, yeah, that's a whole nother uh, podcast, as I as I like to say, because that seems to be a really big problem, too, because oftentimes when you raise these concerns about tech, they kind of look at you like you're a Luddite, right? Like, you don't want your kid to ever get a computer. You know, I've been accused sort of when I've complained to my school district, I was not happy with some of the um, intense computer um, learning profiles that they were doing in, in my child's school. And I, you know, said, look, there's no reason that he has to do every single math assignment on a computer. Could you hand him a worksheet and a pencil? And because there, I've also read studies that show that kids do better when they write things down, memorization, they, they, it, it helps them kind of memorize things, particularly things like grammar rules, you know? And, and so I, you know, and I sort of <laughs> was treated like my child's going to be left in the 18th century, right? Like, oh, it's one of those. And they probably thought, you know, I make my own bread too. And, you know, drink kombucha and, 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 you know, don't want any high tech things in my house. And I was like, no, I, I'm fine with computers. And I think what you said is so important is that there is a place for computers and technology and to get kids used to that. Because I mean, again, we're living in the here and now, but I do think that there's a place to return, um, you know, to, to re- you know, even my child, when he, he reads a book in class, it's on a comp- it's a computer program, right? He loads the book he wants to read, and I'm like, why can't they just go to the library? I don't, I don't understand that. So I think yeah. that is a problem, and I think that's part of this. This is why kids are easily addicted to this stuff because there are authorities in their life telling them that set, being on a computer for eight day for eight hours in a day is normal. Right. And what do, and yeah, and then it just, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, and what do kids want more than anything? They want, (laughs) they want your attention. They want time. And here we are putting a computer in front of them eight, nine hours a day, right? Uh, You know, the model that I've really liked is, it's called blended learning, where they spend a third of the class actually with the teacher, and then a third of the time in small groups that are discussing the lesson and then a third of the time on the computer, maybe reinforcing or taking the test, yeah. but it's blended where they're getting that, that human interaction and they're hearing from their teacher at different times, but they're also learning as a team. I, I think we're, we're all, you know, there's so many, there's so much, uh, there's so much that we're learning from this last, the last 14 months in particular and the impact of a pandemic and the shutdowns and isolation. But one is the importance of human interaction and especially in our kids that they need that, you know, they crave it. And, and if they aren't getting it, then, you know, it leads to other, um, other challenges. Right. And I, I believe that that is part of why the mental health numbers are just surging right now. It's heartbreaking. The number of kids that are in crisis that are depressed or anxious or, you know, that, that are coming to school now and, and discussing what depressants they're on. Oh, yeah. This well, is you, you know, I, I want to, um, I honestly, I could talk to you about the tech stuff for another hour, but I know your time is limited, but I do want to talk to you a little bit, um, pivoting a little bit to special needs children. You are a devoted and fierce champion for the, the um, I like how you call it, the ability community. Um, you are a special needs mom, and I am too. I have a child with some pretty complicated special educational needs, um, and we those needs were not being met by our community's uh, public school. And I've been homeschooling my son for this past year. (laughs) And it's been an incredible experience, very rewarding. And he's done incredibly well, you know, but I can't help but get a little angry, Congresswoman, when I think about the fact that for the 10 years he was in the public school, that school district that I sent him to got 32,000 a year for him. And we struggled every single day to get him the services we need. I struggled every single day to get the respect that I feel like every special needs parent deserves. And I struggled to be heard. Um, And we know that this is true of so many special needs parents across the country, particularly during this pandemic, special needs kids have really suffered the most. So I'm finally to my question, sorry for that large lead in, but you know, it's been decades since the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, became law. This law is supposed to guarantee, it's a federal guarantee, 
that special needs kids will get an education, I think most parents would say it isn't working. I'd love to get your opinion on this. And maybe you could give some, I don't know, maybe tell us if Congress can do anything to help or plans to do anything to help. Yes. Uh, well, I appreciate you sharing your story. And I, I join with you and, and I am a proud member of the disabilities community now. And, and Cole, our 14 year old, has been in public schools and has received a lot of a lot of help along the way. IDEA, I'm grateful for IDEA mm -hmm. that now gives our children an opportunity to learn and to get an education. But I agree that it needs to be updated. It was yeah. passed in the 70s and it needs to be updated. I also am looking at legislation that would make clear that would that the money would file follow the student. Yes. So that if you're an individual, if you're if your child has a disability, that no matter what school that that child decides to attend, you know, as soon as they turn three, they qualify within within our our um, qualify for schooling. And I believe that parents need to be empowered to make a decision as to what school is going to be best for their child. And so we're looking at that legislation and and for COVID in particular. Over the last 14 months, I've heard from so many families who have children with disabilities that have been especially, it's been an especially yes. challenging time for them. And there's a, a bipartisan a group of members on Capitol Hill that is calling for an investigation as to the impact of the school closures for children with disabilities that we really need to uh, get some questions answered as to the impact of remote and virtual learning and whether or not you know kids with disabilities were discriminated against but also how they were cut off from support yes. systems yes. from the, the the therapies that they need and and the impact of isolation and in, in being at home rather than actually getting the the support that they needed during this time well, I, you know, I pulled my child out in it last, you know, in the fall of last year, because I knew I, because we had that small testing period from March until the end of the year. And I could tell he just, he, it was not working for him. So we pulled out of the public schools. And again, I said, I've been homeschooling, um, but I have, been, I've sort of watched what's been happening to, you know, I have friends in this community that their, their children are still going to my local public school. And what I think was so upsetting to me is that my local public school has a, a um, a program called citywide. That's why I don't know why it's called citywide, but it's for children who have the most severe disabilities. So they might be blind. They may um, have some medical reason that they can't be in a room with other children, medically fragile. Um, they down syndrome children are sometimes put in the, the citywide program for specialized instruction. Um, but they have usually the most difficult cases and, there's only of the K through five grade levels, there's only about 150 of them in the entire city, my entire city. And my city refused even to bring that small cohort back. And so we're talking telling a blind child to sit on a screen and or a child with hearing loss to do virtual. I mean, these are the kinds of stories that I really think do need investigation because, again, we know that they could, you know, look, I think there was a lot of sympathy when it first hit and the schools first shut down. But by fall of 2020, certainly some accommodations could have been made for children who desperately need in person. Um, so I, I really am happy to hear that Congress is interested in looking into this because who knows if this is going to happen again. But we do need to better care for our most vulnerable students. And again, schools are getting a ton of money to care <laughs> to care for these students. It's not like they're getting, you know, here's a thousand bucks. I mean, my child was worth thirty two thousand dollars. And so I really do hope that Congress looks into this. And I'm, I'm glad to help to hear that that is a possibility. Absolutely. There's there's too many examples where it, it felt like the schools turned their back on yeah. our kids. And these, you know, the stories that, that you're just sharing, they just reinforce that remote, the virtual learning, it 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 absolutely discriminated against some it of did. our children. Yes. The the Individuals with Disabilities Education yeah. Act. You know, I I, I think that's it's interesting because I've heard you say, you know, earlier you said, you know, every child learns differently and I love that you're um, you know, you're, you've got a bill where the money would follow the student. And all of this is pointing to the need for school choice, you know, and I obviously think you support fully full choice. It's, 
interesting mm-hmm. how this shutdown and the pandemic has really, I think, put into sharp relief the need, the desperate need for parents to have more choices. And yet, you know, I'm part of a disability community here in my town where, you know, parents of special needs children sort of talk online um, and, and, and are sort of a community advocating for each other. But I don't see the school choice thing really raised much. And I'm careful, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be like, you know, uh, the crazy pro cho- or pro um, pro school choice person on the, on the boards. But I, but I do wonder if the, if people sort of in the disability community, why they, they aren't really vocal on that. And maybe I'm wrong. Am I wrong on that? What, what's the connection there? Can you tell me about that? Well, that's a great question. I think that COVID has really pulled the curtain back and allowed us to look into our children's classrooms and see more clearly what is being taught, as well as uh, how the you know what the commitment is of the school to our our children's education. For a period of time, we had our kids in Washington D.C., and it's interesting, Washington D.C. Several years ago, it was back in the 90s, actually, that there was a huge education reform put in place in Washington, D.C. And it it included the opportunity scholarships, but it also, today in Washington, D.C., 50% of the kids attend a a charter school. Yeah. Um, And there's lots of different choices. As a parent, I was was amazed the choices that were available. So if you are, if you are, if your child, you know, there's the, the school where there's 95% of the kids, uh, St. Colette is 95% of the kids are children with disabilities and they're more severe. And if that's what you think is the best learning environment for your child, that's an option for you. Yeah. There's others where it's 50, there's others that were, you know, uh, for example, uh, there's, there were some that, uh, uh, were just a 5% special needs, but they just a, a lot of different choices. There were the ones that were more focused on math and science and technology and just, um, anyway, and as a, as a parent, you could opt, you could apply for any school that you wanted to attend. You were responsible for the transportation, but if it was public, if it was private, if it was um, a, a charter school, you could opt into that school. And I, I've always kind of puzzled as to why more people uh, aren't aware, first and foremost, that in our nation's capital, that is available for, for our kids. And the Opportunity Scholarship used to be a part of that. Which, yeah. Uh, under the Obama administration, they were taken away. And, and especially African-American parents were up in arms right. that the Opportunity Scholarship was taken away. Yeah. Um, the parents in D.C. are, they cherish having yeah. that option. And if your child is in a school that is not meeting your child's needs, then you can, it, you, it's, it's a lottery every year, right? You, you apply, but you have that ability to apply to a different school and see if it's a better fit. And, and it absolutely has it just positively impacted the outcomes among kids that, otherwise may have been left behind. Well, I think you've really nailed it there when you say a lot of parents may not be aware of these opportunities. And once they experience it, though, or get a hint that this is a possibility, then there is such love of of having that flexibility. And so I think one thing that you're doing that is so important is helping to educate parents like me. Um, you know, I, again, I have a special needs child and I, str- I struggle. I, I, I've always struggled in, in my local community, but, you know, through the help of friends and through the help of people, other people who talk to me about homeschooling, you know, I made a better decision for my child. And so I think really it's a, it's a matter of getting the word out that, there are proposals out there like yours where money could follow the student. And when you say money, I mean, it's a lot of money. What could you do with that money if you had the choice to pick a school that's best for your child? The the possibilities are really exciting. So I really appreciate you um, you obviously uh, looking into that and 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 introducing a bill uh, to do that. That's that's a really exciting thing. And I, I really appreciate all that you've done looking out for our kids um, from the, the big tech companies and, and everything else that you're doing to, to, to improve the country, to improve the nation. Well, thank you. Thanks for helping get the word out. It's been great to be with you today. And this is, this is one of those moments, I think, when we get to reassess coming out of COVID, 
my hope is that this will be a new era in that, you know, we've all learned a ton that it will not be business as usual, but that we will be able to apply what we've learned and really make sure that, uh, especially in this case, our kids are, are getting the best education possible and that we are also holding big tech accountable. We've learned a lot about big tech uh, during COVID and we need, we need to make some changes. Well, listen, we are, we really are in agreement on this and, you know, the, this podcast and IWF really wants to help and, uh, and get the word out as well. We hope you'll come back. I hope you'll come back and talk to me as this develops and as this goes on. And I really want to thank you for speaking on behalf of a lot of parents who are concerned of this stuff and speaking to some pretty powerful people about the need for true transparency and more information about how these platforms affect children. And of course, thank you for all that you've done um, on behalf of special needs kids. You've just been a, a real hero of mine personally. And, um, and it's great to talk to you about these important issues. It's great to be with you and, and look forward to working with you. This is all important for our children and their futures. It was great to talk to the Congresswoman. Um, this podcast We'll continue to talk to her and to continue to follow um, her efforts um, with keeping big tech accountable. I think it's important also to say here that, look, I do truly believe parents have an important role here. But I also think that big tech companies um, need to be transparent, need to give information about their programs and and how they might affect people. That is what she, what the Congresswoman is asking for. And if they're not going to provide that information, then it really does go beyond a parent's ability um, to, to help their children develop healthy habits. Um, so I do think that we need to consider this sort of out of the realm of just a parent's responsibility. Um, I often say, you know, and I've written endlessly about if you don't like what your children are watching, turn the t- turn the TV off. Um, but one thing that has been interesting is <laughs> it's not the same with these platforms. Um, I'll give you an example. My son is 14. I don't want him to have a phone. But I do want him, um, for instance, he does some stuff. Um, I, I don't want to talk too specifically about my children on this podcast. But one of my children children does do some work um, and and he has a, a place he has to be every week. And I want him to have, he's far, far, slightly far away. And I want him to be able to contact us. So we ended up buying a wrist phone. And the wrist phone has, it's just a little, it's, you wear it, it looks like an iPhone. And all it does is call. In fact, it only can call four numbers. Um, it's n- becoming less useful because, um, you know, sometimes he might need a map or look at the weather or some other things that would be helpful to him. There's really nothing out there except for these really sophisticated smartphones. And it's not like you can get a limited plan. It's really impossible. There just really aren't those products out there. And so it's, it's, it makes it hard for, as a parent to limit their ability to see certain things when you don't have that kind of control. There are some other controls, um, you know, parental controls that can be you put on some technologies, but those things are easily overridden. Anyway, the point is, is that these are very powerful companies and parents do have a role, but I think it really is important. Um, and I think it's important from a regulatory state that, that we know um, that Congress have some idea of, of how these platforms are developed and how they do um, impact the well-being of children. I think that is a completely reasonable thing to ask for. And again, as uh, the Congresswoman detailed on the podcast, they are not being transparent. They are not giving all of the information that has been requested. So that's a problem as well. And if she can't get it, if a powerful Congresswoman who's the chair of a powerful House committee can't get it, how are you going to get it? Um, So I think that is something that parents really need to be aware of. And I think as a parent, I'm really thankful that the Congresswoman is up there on Capitol Hill advocating uh, for parents like me who are concerned. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. 
Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.